morning to all. I am going to talk about, uh, yes, theology tonight. Um, in, in, in what way does this uh, intimidating word relate to the subject of durability? Um, in fact, it does in, a very, in the most simplest way possible um, through this well-known concept of eternity. Right? If uh, religion means something, it is this promise of eternity, this promise of the most extreme durability which can think of, and it's it, that way that uh, religion relates to um, our own preoccupation for uh, a, most, a more durable world and life, of course. And this is also why uh, religion is uh, mostly uh, figured in these kinds of representations, which are durable, uh, geometric forms, platonician forms, uh, solid uh, triangles and pyramids as on the famous uh, dollar bill representation of God. Uh, this is also probably why you will find uh, that kind of furniture in temples or churches, uh, plain, solid wood, durable things you would call probably sustainable things today. But uh, in fact, it's not in this way I'm going to tackle this uh, issue of, of durability. Because my idea is a little more paradoxical, it is that this promise of eternity and durability, uh, this concept of eternity, is better represented with that kind of furniture. Now, uh, maybe you are in doubt because you have uh, tried out these kinds of things and they don't last a lot. Um, but of course, you can, you can, you can think of uh, a reason why I say this, and this is because through obsolescence, um, you can have a sense of infinity uh, uh, through your own sense of death, in a way. You also join this world of, of eternity, and this is, of course, that kind of representation that is uh, uh, involved in that vanity. But still again, this is not the way I'm going to uh, address the issue of durability through theology tonight. Uh, my belief is that uh, the way um, eternity, uh, this promise, is embodied um, today is even, in a sense, uh, more radical, you would say, worse. I mean this, that kind of life, modern life, blinking lights, festive car parks, which are, in a sense, the epitome of something which is not religious at all. Uh, you would even say this is the epitome of the dis disenchanted world we are living in. Um, so uh, why, do I, why do I say that, um, such a provocative thing? Uh, because actually, I believe it is written in um, important religious texts and mainly the more prominent uh, ones that, at least in the Western world, have uh, created our religious world. I'm talking of, uh, for instance, St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. Now, this is what St. Paul says about how we will live when we are saved. So, in a sense, when we are ourselves have attained this state of durability. He says, from now, so when we are saved, we will live like this. We will have wives as though we have none. We will mourn as though we don't mourn. Those who rejoice as though they were, were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they have no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with the world. You will have to deal with the world as if not, as if you don't have any dealings with the world. And if you come to think of it, that means when you are saved in this state that St. Paul calls the messianic state, which is just before Judgment Day, just before we actually die and become eternal, we live in this intermediate state. We are saved, but we are not yet eternal. We live like this. We live as if not, as though we don't live. And this, in a sense, is the same as this. We blink. We blink ontologically. We are not, not at not. Uh, I'm not right with this thing, but you see, this is as not, as not. This blinking state is the state, the messianic state St. Paul talks about. So you're going to think I'm kind of crazy saying these kinds of things. This, this, these two worlds are so far apart. But 
In the time that I have, I would just like to evoke two figures that can help us to understand how we get from this uh, very ancient idea of eternity to our world today. And the first figure, the important figure I want to talk about is Luther. Talking about Luther in Rome is a bit of a paradox, but uh, I enjoy it. Um, <coughs> why Luther? Actually, Luther reformed the church by translating the sentence of Paul I just showed. He translated the Bible as well, but he translated this sentence, this very enigmatic sentence after all, because you know all these people reading Paul were saying, I mean, what is this? What is Paul saying about living as if not? What does that mean? And Luther had an idea. He said this messianic condition, we should call it beruf. It's klesis in Greek. Klesis means the condition in which you are called by God. Um, and this condition is that condition of living as if not. And Luther said, okay, let's call it Beruf in German, Klesis. Beruf means being called, Ruf, like telephone call, and Ruf. And it's all, it also means to work. It means that in the messianic state we will be working, that this condition of living as if not means a condition of work, but a certain type of work, working as if not. Working for the sake of work. And if you work for the sake of work, for the pleasure of working, for instance, just because you work, then you produce a surplus of benefits, of richness that you don't use, you don't consummate. You reinvest it or you put it aside, and you create something which is actually capitalism. This is why Max Weber thought this word beruf was absolutely capital to the understanding of our society. It comes from the ancient times of St. Paul and the Apostles, and through the 16th century, boom, arrives beruf, and this way of being as if not into work, into working things as if you were not working, and creating that kind of things. No, not quite. We're not yet uh, arrived to McDonald's. He would have hated it, and uh, um, um, I, I probably have to skip to the other person I wanted to talk about, Marcel Duchamp. No link at all to what I've just said. Uh, no link to religion at all. Marcel Duchamp, you know, a theist, total, uh, no interest at all for religion. And I guess contemporary art as such, very, um, very... Uh, uh, anxious about anything which deals with religion and uh, anything like this. And for people who criticize uh, contemporary art, a way it's kind of difficult actually to, 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 to interact with because it has nothing to do with transcendence or anything. It's kind of cynical sometimes, it's uh, nihilistic in another way. It's also a symbol of a disenchanted world. Why do I show this uh, picture of Marcel Duchamp and his bicycle wheel? Because what did Marcel Duchamp create with a ready-made? He created something, usually say, he put an ordinary object in a museum. And then we kind of think about, what does that mean? How is that possible? Just think about it differently. Just think that this is actually an ordinary object, as if not an ordinary object, as a work of art. Or the contrary, it's a work of art, as if not a work of art. It's actually both. It's an ordinary object and a work of art, and it's the and piece which is important. It is both. It blinks in the same way as we have seen. Are we sure of this? Are we sure that Duchamp wanted to create blinking pieces out of his work? Yes. This is a door he made for his own interior. He was very satisfied with this door because it actually opens a, 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 a room by closing the other and reciprocally, you see? The two rooms are next to, the, to each other. So it's both closed and open, or open and closed. It's an eucantic state. It blinks. We have other examples of this in contemporary art. This is a famous candle by Gerhard Richter. What's interesting about this is that it's both a photography and a painting. It blinks in its own medium. Photography blinks into um, a painting and reciprocally. It's a photography as if not. It's a painting as if not. And this produces a very strange effect, which is light. The bicycle wheel of Duchamp was supposed to be like a chimney. 
it, the, the, he, he used to make it turn, and the sparkles of light made like a kind of chimney. And this is, we find again that blinking creates light. Blinking also is that kind of stuff you can find in contemporary art, Bridget Riley paintings. That makes you blink, makes your eyes blink. And of course, you can think of something else which looks like it, which is, well, before digital uh, 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 televisions, that kind of uh, picture would appear on your TV screen. This comes from uh, Tin, uh, Tintin, Castafiore, uh, Jules, Hergé. And this is the relationship between these blinking objects created in contemporary art and these electronic objects that we are surrounded with. Our world is surrounded by things that blink. We blink when we work in a cap capitalist society, and we make things that blink. We have actually captured the blinking nature of the world itself, electricity. This is very recent. It's only two, 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 200 years old. Electricity is negative and positive. It is the same kind of energy, that messianic energy that circulates in these TV screens, in these blinking things that are all over our places, all over our cities. So you understand what I mean now by saying the promise embodied in religion of eternity, of durability. This is a messianic state that realizes, materializes itself in these strange forms that kind of seem to be the most obsolete and ridiculous forms possible. Now, you might say, is this good news? Should we be saved, really, if this is what we have to deal with? Um, the answer is probably yes and no. I mean, no, probably, because it is kind of scary. It is kind of scary to imagine that the last word of uh, the history of, uh, of thought in mankind is radioactivity. Um, but after all, I mean, if we are to come to Judgment Day, uh, it is normal that we should become radioactive, radioactive, and it's normal that we should be scared. And in another sense, we could probably think in another way. Walter Benjamin said that Judgment Day was not to come after history, but it was actually coming all the time, that it was the time of now. And St. Paul himself said something very interesting about the Judgment Day. He said, I tell you a mystery. We will be changed in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So that would mean every time something blinks, the Day of the Judgment actually operates. And we are not, maybe we are not, in the messianic state, but already past it. So that would explain something very interesting, which is this. It's not the pyramid which is interesting. It is this eye, the eye of God. And maybe it is blinking at you. Thank you very much.